Welcome to Cause of Craft. I'm your host, John Tilton. Why do we create? Where do our ideas come from? What does our craft say about us? These are the ideas we explore here on the show. And this week, I'm joined by MC Beeler, author of Sacred, to discuss what it's like to spend nine years on a project, the benefits of self-publishing, and why it feels so good to have someone else read your work. Welcome, Maggie. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm super excited. Uh, You must be excited because you have a book out. Can you tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm releasing my first book next week. It's actually a week from today, and today is the recording date. So very exciting. I It doesn't feel real quite yet, <laughs> but um, I'm sure in a week it will feel real to have a book out. I've been you know, working on it for nine years, so it's finally going to be out there, and it's just very exciting. Yeah, nine years, that's not... Uh, like a short amount of time. That's a big chunk of your life there. Yeah, right. What made you first decide you wanted to write? And this might be a different part of the answer, but mm-hmm. what kept you working on it for such a long time to see it through to this point? Yeah, so those are good questions. To the what made me want to write? Well, I feel like obviously I have the cliche answer that I've always been into writing, but... It's actually kind of a funny story. So I was on vacation in Florida and I was 12. So I was kind of, you know, an annoying like preteen, whatever. And I was really bored and I kept nagging my mom about like my boredom and I wanted some sort of solution. So she bought me a notebook and told me, she's like, you're creative, sit down and write. And I was like, okay. So I started writing, and at the time, I was very into the show Ben 10. I don't know if you would know of that show. Of course, but, yeah. Um, it was a pretty popular show at the time, and I was very into it. So my first draft was, to be quite honest, of Ben 10 fan fiction. And it was just very entertaining to write that and what kept me going over the years is I think I sort of realized as I was writing, you know, I I shared bits and pieces of what I wrote with my parents and it was very exciting to share something and hear feedback. So I think that sort of feeling really carried me through it is the, the feeling of like getting some sort of confirmation that what you're doing is like good and worth it and like worthwhile. So I really wanted to like, see this project through though over the years uh, I mean it took me nine years to finish this thing so I wasn't consistently working on it it was more of like a in the back of my head like oh I have this this book and I kind of want to publish it but I don't really want to like work on it because it's like a lot of work and I would like work on it for like a week at a time I'd like write for like a week straight and and then I'd put it away for like a month And then I'd like pull it back out and like type a couple words and put it away for a while. And it was just this whole like cycle of like working on it and then not working on it. And then at a certain point, I think I was like 18 or 17, I was like, I really want to publish this thing and I want to take the steps to learn how to like publish a book. And I learned and I took the steps and I finally finished and now it's going to be out in a week. (laughs) That's so I don't awesome. know if that answers the question. I kind of got a little long-winded there. <laughs> no, it definitely does. And I think you answered both parts of it really well in the same kind of, the same answer did cover both things. And so that's really mm-hmm. interesting, you know, both how you got started led into why you kept going. I, yeah. I was, it, it struck me when you talked about how you put it away and came back to it. Did mm-hmm. you find have you been able to look back on the times that you were taking it back out to work on it and ha- like what was was anything particular prompting that or was it more of a, oh I have some extra time I'm going to pull it back out I'm bored I'm going to pull it back out or it yeah. was it something else that drove you to come back to your manuscript you know quite honestly I don't know I want to say like <laughs> I mean to get a little spiritual on you I don't know. I feel like I just had something in the back of my head that was like, you got to like do this. Like, 
this is like something that's really important and will be really important to you. And it obviously is. It's like kind of my life now. But um, I don't know. I just like I'd be like sitting around in my room and I'd be like, eh, I kind of want to like just work on this thing because like I have it and like I had shared it with a couple people at the time who told me that it was good. And obviously they were lying because it was a first draft and it was really, really bad. Um, but their encouragement kind of like in the back of my head, you know, pushed me to keep going. And I think that's really important for like people who are like just starting off in the creative industry to really have that like, can, like the confirmation that like what they're doing is worthwhile and like will be worthwhile. And I think that's really what like carried me through it the entire way is that like I had people who were like telling me that what I was doing was worthwhile and what I was doing was good. And that in the back of my head was like, oh, I I like need to keep doing this because it's good and it's worthwhile. Yeah, well, I think anyone who spends that amount of time working on a project, like there's something about them that I meant to do this. And I think Mm -hmm. it's funny you mentioned about, oh, well, my friends were lying because it was a first draft. (laughs) You know, I, I wouldn't be so sure about that. It is you know, I've had terrible first drafts. I think, I think most first drafts are probably terrible for everyone, no matter how seasoned they are, (laughs) but there's something, there's something there. I think if you have, if you're meant to be doing it and you have some talent, even if you don't know how to bring that talent out of yourself yet, I think people can look at elements of it and, you know, Mm -hmm. it requires a friend or family member or someone who has a good eye for seeing in sensing what's there behind kind of the mess Mm -hmm. and know that there, Oh, there's some gold in here that I can see, even though it's not all uncovered yet. So I think kind of, I'm tempted to say the same thing where it's like, Oh, people are being disingenuous about what they say about some of my early writing. But when I talk to them specifically about what they do like about it, and I Mm -hmm. understand the elements that are working And then I notice, oh, they're not saying this or, oh, I have a mentor who points this piece out of my writing that I can improve. Right. I think it's all that process of going into something, chipping away at it until you really have a refined product that that speaks to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that because it's definitely they definitely weren't like looking at like my grammar or my like dialogue or whatever. They were more probably looking at like the imagination and the ability to like come up with something like that just like randomly not like you know the actual story structure which is like I think really good like to just encourage people at a young age you know just not criticizing everything because it can like ruin you know if I had showed my parents or my mentor I did have like a little not, not not an official mentor but he was like a a family friend that was in the publishing business and I would talk to him a lot about writing. If I had showed them my draft and they said, this sucks, I would probably never have continued. So it's just like really important how you go about talking to young creatives, I think personally. What is it about Ben 10 that spoke to you as a kid? Is is it, I actually, I know of the show, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, so I just, like, well, I was actually, like, so obsessed with it at the time. I would, like, just, I downloaded all, I had, like, a Kindle Fire at that age, and I just, like, downloaded all of the episodes onto my Kindle Fire, and my mom thought that I was, like, reading, but I was really just, like, watching by then. (laughs) And, well, I took the idea of the two cousins and their grandpa in a trailer going around on these, like, cool quests and, like, having all these magical powers, which, like... You can kind of see it seeping into my novel now a little bit with like the the powers and stuff, but not as much. I mean, my like I literally had it down to the T. Like it was a boy main character and his like redheaded cousin female. <laughs> so it was like very much the same, but yeah, over the years it changed a lot obviously, and I think it's just like how much I worked on it and how much I was changing as a person throughout those years. Cause I mean, 12 to 21 is like a really like big age range and like you go through a lot of change then. So I think 
my story was like growing and changing as I grew and changed. And it, it yeah, I, I just like really did a lot of like, I don't know, like editing with the plot. And I really don't even know how to like explain how it changed. It just kind of happened. Like I would Gradual. go through and look at parts and be like, oh, this needs to be something else. And I think it, it also uh, ties into me learning what actual story structure is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, I'm sure. Yeah, it's both kind of identifying what's speaking to you. And that's yeah. why that's one of the questions I actually had listed down here to ask you was just, mm-hmm. again, branching off that nine year aspect of this project for you. Mm-hmm. Like I think about, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you are. And my first book took about three years to do a okay. little bit on and off. And I think about how much I, I've changed in that time. Mm-hmm. And this is an age range that I've done. This is a short amount of time. And it's an age range where you don't really change as much as, you know, the ages from 12 to 21, right? Uh-huh. So uh, so it, it just blew my mind when you first told me that you had worked on this project for nine years. I was just like, okay, like how many times was this rewritten? Like how, yeah. what, like, is there any scenes? I guess that's a, another question is maybe without giving anything mm-hmm. too much away that you don't want to, but is there a scene that really stayed with the book the entire time that, mm-hmm. that you can point to as like, wow, that's like, that's like who I am is like in the scene or. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, about the drafts first, it literally, I think I counted how many drafts I have. I have about like 14 drafts of this novel. Oh, yeah. Uh, not including like the written ones, but throughout all of those drafts, there is one scene that has stayed very consistent throughout them all. And I don't think it's much of a spoiler because it happens within like the first four chapters and it's kind of in the blurb too. I mean, obviously she goes into another world. So there's a scene where she goes into a cave And I won't really expand much, but she goes into a cave and that has been in pretty much every draft, not the first draft, because the first draft was like literal Ben 10 fan fiction, just like going in an RV, whatever. Um, (laughs) But the cave thing has been consistent through it all. And if you've read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, And also characters there's a couple characters who have stayed consistent i have a character in my novel who's basically a giant talking lizard and he's been in every single draft thus far and my side character well she's not a side character really anymore she was a side character but my main character reagan has been in every draft as well and there's one more, I believe. I have a giant talking dog as well. I'm kind of very into the talking animals um, named Long Paws, who's also been in every draft. So those three have survived the nine years of revisions. <laughs> it was really interesting when you mentioned those things because those elements are directly... Re- I've been really into learning more about Carl Jung, um, and I've been reading uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces by uh, mm-hmm. Joseph Campbell. Sure. And the lizard person and the going into a cave, like those are big, like within us story elements, or at least, you know, there's obviously debate about these sorts of things, but those two elements are often things that come up in stories, Belly or the uh, cave being... Uh, kind of the belly of the whale element. So mm-hmm. it's interesting that that's there. And to be in the fourth chapter, that's exactly where it goes, you know, in the hero's journey. So mm-hmm. and I'm guessing you're not reading Joseph Campbell when you're 12 years old. So <laughs> so I think it's it's always so fascinating to me how much these things do actually show up mm-hmm. um, in people's work. And there's just something about being human that like is leading us to this. And uh, there's also the the lizard people. That's that's something that uh, shows up a lot in different yeah. fiction as well. And so it's interesting that those two things uh, have stayed consistent um, yeah. because of their connection to those. But of course, you know, they're coming out. And and I think that's why it's so fascinating to me, these sorts of things, because how it shows up in different people's work is completely different. And so you yeah. find out all these things about a person based on how they 
how they approach these kind of deep seated things that are somewhere in our brains. And so it's just fascinating to me. I, I've always been interested in how that works and, and how it comes out in different people's stories. Yeah. Well, I, I've thought about that too, because I heard, I saw a little post a while ago that pretty much everyone is writing almost the same story. I mean, because we use the hero's journey template and, and there's a ton of other like templates, but it's really how you make that story your own, like using all these, because yeah. I mean, someone came up with dragons a while ago and then everyone uses them now in their own way in their own novel and it's just yeah. like the different ways that you use things that make it unique to like your story yeah and it might not even be a literal dragon it might be yeah. something that uh that resembles it or that even mm -hmm. just hints at something like i'm writing something now and there's a dragon element to it but it's it's not a dragon at all it's a person but the fact yeah. that they're guarding something that's the dragon element, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. classic, like the Hobbit with mm -hmm. uh, the dragon guarding the gold. Um, yeah, there's still that element in it. And it's just it's just so fascinating to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's cool. to It's cool to hear a little bit about how that's showing up in your writing. Because yeah. frankly, that's those ideas are actually kind of what brought me to the idea of the show in general, mm -hmm. because I started thinking, well, why am I writing like what I'm writing like why is this element in the story because I don't know if you have the same experience but a lot of times when I write you know there's there's a lot of intentionality behind it but then all of a sudden something will come in that just pops onto the page and pops into the scene and mm -hmm. I, I just can't control or explain it yeah. and it's it's I kind of have to just explore it that's where I became kind of fascinated with these concepts and trying to figure out, well, why is it that that happens, but also why is the way that I approach it different than everyone else, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. I've, uh, you mentioned something about the ideas just kind of popping into your head. And that kind of <laughs> brought a thought to my mind. Cause I mean, when, when people ask me how I've come up with like, these ideas I'm like I don't know how to like explain it because it's kind of like they just appear in your mind yeah you know it's like there's a there's like another person in there kind of like whispering these ideas and you're just like okay and then you write them down and you're like I don't know how I got this idea. yeah it's it's that and that's probably the closest analogy because it's definitely at least for me it's not like a literal person whispering in my mm -hmm. ear yeah yeah but obviously. it's <laughs> but it's like but I can't explain it because it's like, okay, I'm locked in, I'm writing, and then I have a plan for the scene. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, by the end of the scene, it's like, well, that's not what I planned for. And I'm a big planner, I, or I like to be a big planner in life. Yeah. But I think actually writing has taught me that, well, it's maybe not the most important thing to stick to your plan 100% mm -hmm. and yeah, let, I agree. let what happens happen and respond to it. Like, right. I think going in with a plan is good. But responding to what's real, I think, is is kind of the key to it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, I've actually heard, I mean, I've read a lot about other authors and their processes. And I read a bit about um, George R. R. Martin, the author of Game of Thrones. He writes the book and then he doesn't plan, like he, he writes one book and it's, you know, he wouldn't have planned out the series before. And he'll go through the book and see kind of like what seeds he's sowed and see what yeah. those seeds can like grow into, like work with what you have. But then for me, I don't, I haven't really outlined a story that I've written before. I don't know like what you do, but I, you know, I, I write as much as I can. And then I'll like look back at what I've written kind of like George Martin and kind of see like what I have and like where it can go from there. And then I'll yeah. like kind of like work out a little bit of an outline based off of like what I've got and like what I can work with and stuff like that. But I kind of like to just sit down and write as much as I can without planning because I feel like, you know, like you said, the more planning you do, the more it's like restrictive and it's better to just kind of like let yourself write and see what happens. 
that makes me want to ask you this question. Stop me if I'm not allowed to ask about the sequels, but I oh, understand yeah. that this is part of a trilogy. Is that right? Yeah. So it's, I'm, I mean, if it's two books, it's two books. If it's three books, it's three books. If it's four books, I don't want it to be more 14 than 14 books. books. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I don't, I really don't want it to be more than three. I feel like three is like a nice sweet spot for this series, but if I can wrap it up in the second one, I would, or, you know, just as long as it needs to be, I'm not really, I don't have like a restrictive like guideline or anything. I just am going to write until the story's done, if that makes sense. So you do you right now have kind of a direction you want to start in with book two, or is that going to be like, I guess how much, mm -hmm. and for people who aren't writers, there's kind of this mm -hmm. mentality of, are you a pantser or a planner? And I think most people are probably a mix of both. It sounds yeah. like that's kind of where we're both at. Yeah. But I guess when you start the project, I think there's there's definitely like two camps of like, I started it with all my plans and then it got a little bit changed right. or I started with no plans and then I had to outline later. Yeah. Like what, uh, what's your approach? So I have a couple chapters thought out for the book. I have like a little folder of ideas that I've been stashing stuff in for the second book that you know like I said like the seeds that you sow I've put stuff in the first book that I'm like oh this is totally gonna like grow into this in the next book um so I have like those chapters thought out I guess you could say and I do have the first chapter of the next book kind of written out I like to do for my books I like to start the book off like kind of in the villain's perspective almost. Um, so if you've read my first book, it starts off with the villains. And I do like that because it kind of gives you like a little bit of an insight into like what's going to happen throughout the plot. So I do have that first chapter thought out for my next book and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> but I haven't actually like gone in and like written it yet. I just have like that's cool. Yeah. You know, bullet points of like, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. This character is going to say this and this and this. So like, I have it like planned out, but it's not like in it's it's not written yet. Yeah. So you have like a, a goal. You have your aim in mind. Mm -hmm. But yeah. your your complete, you know, how to approach it yet isn't there yet. Yeah. I think right. That's, I think that's cool. That's a that's a cool thing. Mm -hmm. And I also have, it's the same with the ending. I know exactly how book two is going to end as well. And another cool thing uh, about you is you have a short story that oh, yeah. there's two ways to get it. You can go on Amazon uh, or Barnes and Noble, any of these places and pay the 99 cents. Or if you subscribe to Maggie's email newsletter, you can get it for free. And it's a fantastic mm -hmm. short story. Thank you. So it uses characters that are in the book. Mm -hmm. in, in sacred yes did you find that you had more to tell about those characters or did you kind of go hunting for something you could do a short story like how did, how did the short story come about yeah so i was i'm a, a part of this facebook group and they were kind of nailing it in my head that i needed to have this like newsletter and i was like all right i'll make this newsletter so i made the newsletter and they're like, you should have a newsletter magnet to kind of like draw people into your newsletter. And I was like, okay. So I had that thought in the back of my head, but I wasn't like actually planning to write one because I was like, eh, I don't know, like how, you know, whatever, how big I'll make my newsletter or anything. But now, current day, I love my newsletter. But anyway, so I didn't really want to write the short story thing. And I, I it was in the back of my head. And then one night, <laughs> this was after like... I was going through a breakup, so I was kind of in, like, a moody, like, eh, mood. <laughs> and I was just laying in bed just thinking, and this idea for the short story just, like, popped in my head, like, out of nowhere. And I was like, oh, my God. And I just, like, started writing. I like, pulled out my laptop because I couldn't sleep because I was just, like, so stressed out with all this stuff going on. And I just started writing it. And then I finished it the next day. <laughs> so I was just, like, awesome. really just, like, Kind of like it was almost like I was channeling my emotions from that like breakup into the writing, like almost like kind of a therapy thing. And I found myself doing the same thing right now. 
I'm like going through another breakup and I'm writing another short story. So maybe it's a, it's like a thing that's going to keep happening. Hopefully the Taylor Swift of, of books, right? The Taylor Swift of books. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> <Yeah>. actually, though. <laughs> That's funny that so so I don't relate on the um, writing about the breakup level uh, because when I started writing I I've been married so I I didn't yeah. have that conflict in my life but I do definitely relate to that idea of when you're going through something uh-huh. to write it and and it's interesting because originally we had all these house renovations and it really tore our lives up and mm-hmm. what I went into that time with was this idea of oh no if I write now it's gonna screw everything up like like my mind is not right right now yeah I shouldn't write and I ended up finding out that 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 is exactly the wrong mindset because what ended up happening was I didn't have a way to process what I was going through Mm -hmm. because I wasn't writing and then it ended up doing double damage because when I did start writing, I used all of the kind of emotions and the conflict that I was going through. I figured out how that related to my characters and my story. And I just, it Mm -hmm. just propelled me through the next draft of my novel. And it's so funny because I was like, wait a second, I should have been doing this ahead of time because it would have benefited my book, Mm -hmm. first of all. And then second of all, once I got that all out, like I had this new perspective on the situation yeah. And I thought, well, shoot, I, here I was like miserable about it for so long. And when really all I had to do was just keep working mm-hmm. and I actually would have been able to process it better. So it's it's cool that, you know, obviously there's things that are, you know, big or small, things are awful and you don't want awful things to happen to you. But when yeah. they do, when they inevitably do, there's definitely something that you can tap into to both overcome the problem, but also benefit your writing. So it's, I don't know, it's, Maybe it's a kind of a weird way to look at life, but mm-hmm. but I but I think it's a I think it can be helpful for someone to to think about. Okay, I'm going through this. How can I turn the lemon into lemonade? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've always seen writing as kind of like a therapy type of thing because it it really is like you know you're really absorbed in your writing for that period of time where you are writing. Like when I sit down at my desk and I start to write it's like that's all I'm thinking about so it is like kind of a good little escape from everything that's going on and it's a good way to like you know get your emotions into something that's you know constructive yeah it's interesting you say that too because it is an escape but it's almost Mm -hmm. like if if you know people tell you how to handle a certain situation right and you're like they're like oh just don't think anything about it and just escape and mm-hmm. it's like, okay, that's an option, but then that leads it to its own problems because you're not dealing with the problem. Then you have mm-hmm. the other side of it where it's like, okay, just focus on it, internalize it, figure out what, you know, like really, really think about it. And it's like, well, then you're overthinking about it and you're probably doing some other damage to yourself. But mm-hmm. writing, it's almost like both of those things happening simultaneously bring you into the center point where it's like, okay, I'm escaping the issue but in the back of my mind, I'm actually dealing directly with the issue. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, that's such a, obviously, neither of us are mental health consultants or anything yeah. like that. So we don't, we don't really know the science behind it. But mm-hmm. I really think there's something to the process of writing. And maybe this translates to other disciplines, too, where you're escaping something, but you're also dealing with it in this kind of act of creation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. So you have self-published Sacred. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you go through any any debate with yourself about whether to try out traditional publishing or dive right into self-publishing? Like what all went behind that decision? Yeah. So originally what I was like, just look, like first considering publishing when I was like 16 or something like that, it was, it was in like fresh, it was... I don't know what year of high school it was, like maybe like sophomore something year. I have, I considered both options because I think it's best to, you know, obviously consider both options first before you make a decision. So I really did a lot of research into both industries at first. But the more I started learning about 
self-publishing, the more I realized that this was the option for me because I would I wanted to have complete creative control over my project. You know, I had a vision for what I wanted and I was going to make that vision a reality. I didn't want there to be any middleman making decisions for me. I wanted to be at the forefront. And I've kind of always had this like sense of like, like this entrepreneurial spirit. So I, it was a very exciting thing for me to take this project head on. And I mean, I've, it's had its ups and downs, of course, you know, self-publishing is quite stressful because you're the only one doing it. Um, and the success of your book really hinges on like what you do. But of course, success is different for everyone. What depends on your definition. But anyway, it definitely was the option for me because of the creative control and the, you know, having my own project in my name in my hands and yeah, just like being able to do everything by myself, which I mean, for some people that might be a little daunting, you know, having to do everything by yourself is definitely daunting. But um, for me personally, which is why I say like, definitely research your options before you make a decision, you know, just because one person does something doesn't mean that it's like right for you. So, you know, of course, research the options before you make a decision because what works for someone might not work for you. And self-publishing ended up working out very well for me. So, yeah. You did a live stream the other day Mm -hmm. with the hardbacks coming in. Yeah. It's just the quality is really good, both on the product itself, but in the design. You really Mm -hmm. thought through every element with your designer and you guys did a good job. And not only that, but inside the book, you have illustrations. Mm -hmm. So each is it each chapter or how many illustrations do you have? Yeah, every chapter has an illustration. And then there's a map as well. I mean, I might be making an assumption, but you did not draw the illustrations. Is that right? No, I hired out an illustrator. Okay. And so when you're working with that person, how did you communicate kind of what you wanted? And did it take long to get to a place where you're like, oh, that's that's what I mean? Or like, can you talk about that process? Yeah. So I... I did. I wrote out little descriptions for every single header, and I would be like, I, I included reference photos of what I wanted. I made it as clear as possible that, um, you know, what I wanted, and she was pretty much spot on, and and she did a great job with, you know, I have a couple of the, a couple of the headers are creatures that I've actually made up, so you know she did a really good job bringing those to life, and you know working with me. I think. It's all about finding the right person to work with Mm -hmm. because, you know, there's tons of creators out there. And, of course, many of them are very talented, but, you know, it's all about finding the person who kind of, like, matches your vibe and sees your vision and knows, like, you know, kind of understands you. It's a little bit of a mutual understanding between the creator and the, you know, the commissioner because, Obviously, they get a little bit of creative control as well. But yeah, I, I sent descriptions of what I wanted. And she was she was very spot on with all of them. I think, you know, I found a good artist and she did a really good job. And this is separate from the cover designer, right? So that's yes. two different people. And, and yep. so I imagine it's kind of the same thing. You think, okay, what do I want from the perspective of what someone sees when they pick up the book and then what do I want when they're experiencing the story Mm -hmm. yeah it's actually I have a cover designer a map like a cartographer I guess is the official name and then I have an interior illustrator so I have three different artists working with me on this project though for my cover which is kind of funny I actually am the character on the cover so I like took a photo of myself in that position and then drew it out. So that's kind of like a weird little tidbit that people don't know about. That's cool. I did not know that about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Cool. Well, the cover looks great. Everything about it really looks great. So congratulations on that. And by the time this episode is out, the book will be available. So some Mm -hmm. of the, some of what we're talking about is like, Oh, looking forward to release, but just the, you know, being a new podcast, we're recording a little bit ahead of time. So um, when did you, okay, so you're writing when you're 12. Mm-hmm. And then you are changing this kind of semi 
Ben 10 fan fiction into something yeah. that's your own. Uh-huh. I imagine at 12 or 13 or whatever the age is, you're not thinking, oh, I'm going to self-publish this one day. Yeah. Uh, because A, self-publishing was super, super new when you were that age. Yeah. And so it's probably not even on your radar. No. But I guess when does the switch flip for you thinking, you know what? I don't just write this. I write this so other people can experience it. Yeah. Well, yeah. When I first started writing, I I had no intentions of publishing. I was just writing for fun and like seeing what happened. And so I, you know, I was talking with my, I call him my mentor, but he's not really a mentor. He's more of like a, a friend, like a family friend that I was really close with. I was talking to him and he suggested he, he suggested that I look into publishing and I was like, Oh, I don't know. Like I, I, at the time it was kind of like, Oh, publishing a book. That's like, I can't like, I can't do that. Like that's not something that's like even an option available, whatever. Like publishing a book just was like, you know, cause I feel like everyone when they're little is like, Oh, I want to publish a book, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it was like a weird, like out of the reach kind of thing. But I considered it. I was like, oh, that'd be cool. Like if I could publish it. And then over the years, he kept telling me I should look into it. And when I got to be like 16, 17, something, somewhere around there, I really was like, I mean, what if I did like look into publishing? Because it's like, why not? Why not just like research publishing? Because I'd been working on this thing for so long and I wanted to kind of like you know, do something with it. So I like did the research and then I decided that I was going to take my, like take a shot at it. And that was at first I was interested in traditionally publishing. So I was doing like research into agents and stuff like that. But then I discovered self-publishing and that really took, that really took hold in my mind. And that's when I was like, ah, this is going to be, this is, I'm going to self-publish this book and it's going to happen. And I started doing all that research and I got my cover designed way early (laughs) because I was like, all right, I'm going to finish this book within the next month and I'll publish it. But that was when I was like 17. So obviously that did not happen. It took me a lot longer than a month to finish. But, you know, with that, it's like take however long you need. It doesn't need to, you know, doesn't matter if it takes you a month or nine years to finish something. It's you know, that dedication to continue working on it is like really what matters. But yeah, I don't know. Long winded answer to the question. Well, it's funny because you mentioned you getting the cover done Mm -hmm. uh, early. And, you know, I think that kind of speaks to it almost sounds like you kind of had like once you decided you were going to do it, you almost had like this fearlessness about it, like, like just going to go ahead and do it. Like it wasn't Mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like you had a lot of like doubts creeping in at that point did you or and that was just a different sort of response or did you ever have that come into play later I feel like I've always had the confidence about it because it's been a passion project for me I mean I've been working on it for nine years so you know it was more I want to publish this because it's been so important to my life for so long I don't really care, you know, how well it do, it does. I'm publishing this because this is my passion and I wanted, like, I set my mind to it and this is kind of like a goal accomplishment for me. But, of course, you know, I want the book to be successful because obviously anyone who puts something out wants it to be successful. But in the back of my mind, I do, I'm just very happy with, you know, any sort of result. You know, I put this book out. And it sells one copy and I'll be thrilled. I'll be excited about that. But, you know, if I put it out and it's well received, that's also good. But for me, it's just it's been such a huge passion project. This is just something that I needed to do in my life. And having it finally done is like, wow, I've like I've done this. I can do anything, you know. Yeah, so I know what you mean. The doubts <laughs> haven't really been like that big because it's been a passion project, you know, the worst that can happen is it flops. And then I write another book and whatever, you know, it's just, it's, it's like, I saved up all this money for this. You know, I don't want to spend my money on anything else. Like this is like 
my like thing. I don't know. It's like it's hard to like explain because I don't know. It's like it's weird. It's it's such a passion, such a very important thing to me. So, but yeah, obviously, I do want it to be successful because <laughs> that'd be that'd be cool. So is there something about like the, you know, you mentioned if just one person reads it or, and again, we were talking about when you decided you wanted to publish it, what does it mean to you when you have a reader and, you know, these ideas that you've had for nine years or developed the story for nine years, like, like. I struggle to ask this question because I'm like, if someone asked me this question, I don't know how I'd answer it. Yeah. I don't know. It's so like, sometimes that's unfair, but uh, like, like, I don't know if you've been able to identify and maybe that's why I want to ask it. Cause I'm like trying yeah. to identify this in myself too. Like, like what is it about like having someone else read it that is satisfying? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. It's just, I think it really comes down to like the affirmation that like, the confirmation that you know what you're doing is worthwhile and like that you've created something that's like a value to someone else and you know when I see someone reading it or when I hear that someone really enjoyed the story I'm like okay so like that's awesome like I spent so much time on it and it was worth it and it was worthwhile and people are enjoying it and it's like giving them something to do in their free time, you know, helping them through something, you know, whatever, like they're that your creative work is appreciated. And it's just, it's like, it's kind of deeper than that though. I feel like, like when someone reads your book, it's like deep down in you, you're like, you have this feeling. It's like, Oh wow. Like that's awesome. I don't know how to explain the feeling, but like, you know, when I would get, reviews for my short story and people would message me saying that they loved it or whatever or that they cried or something like that I was just like deep down like had this feeling I was like that's awesome like like it's just such a it's such a weird thing to explain like like you said well, yeah I okay I happened. think in what you're saying I think you're helping me understand it better too which is yeah. why okay I'm a guy to ask now because I don't know there's something about like Someone else reading it because what you can put in a novel is different than what you can just talk about. Like yeah. most people, I don't think can describe just the emotional journey and the and what an author can contain into a novel. Like if you mm-hmm. had the same amount of words to not use a story and say what you're trying to say, yeah, it's not going to come off the same way. And no. so, having part of yourself in a fictional story is almost this way of communicating to someone else how you feel. And so to have someone else read it, you are then heard uh, in a way that you can't be heard uh, by just speaking to someone. Like like me and you talking now, like we can get into deep issues like we have and talk about all these things, Mm -hmm. but it's not the same as when, like, so I read an early draft of your novel and it's like, oh, like, like there's some like there's elements here where you know you go through it and then oh I've heard something that this person is communicating right and and mm-hmm. I think there's just this extra kind of you know magical if they, I don't know if there's a better word but yeah magical value to understanding someone uh, through reading their work and so I yeah. wonder if there's a little bit of that element and then kind of going off of that. And going off of what you were saying, you mm-hmm. know, when you see some, or when you read a, someone else's novel, and you go through this experience of, wow, what a satisfying story, and it really spoke to me. You know, I've really, I really connected with the story. Like, there's just something about that that's so powerful. Mm-hmm. And so, the ability to give that feeling to someone else, I think, yep. is, you know, it's almost like you know, you mentioned this, this mentor of yours, and I'm sure uh, that. Because I have someone in my my life who has mentored me a lot. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times I think, why is this person spending so much time on me? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And Mm -hmm. then I've explored kind of this idea, too. And and I think about times that I've been able to mentor someone about something else or even writing now. And it's like there's something about it where, like, helping someone to be able to – 
give that gift of their story to someone. Like there's just something powerful there. And yeah. again, it's like, it's almost like we, we have to talk around it because we can't, maybe that's, yeah. what, that's what our story should actually be. We should have a story about what it's like to read a story and then maybe yeah. someone will understand it. But but It's hard to explain. Yeah. But I think we at least we at least wrestled with it, which is mm-hmm. which is good. We we attempted the explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hard. I mean, it's like I feel like writing is such like a personal thing, and and then you like share it with other people, and they can interpret it in their own way based on like what they're going through. And it's just it's weird. Writing is, I mean, writing is obviously very special, and it's something that I think you know, will be around forever because it's like a way of telling something. It's a way of like expressing your emotions. It's a way of expressing who you are. It's literally like an outlet, I feel like, to to who a person is. And it's just such an important like thing in our in our world. And I just, you know, I love writing. <laughs> same here, same here. I love writing too. And I think that's a great note to end on. Maggie, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to have you. I really enjoyed this conversation. Just want to thank you again for letting me come on here and being your first guest. (laughs) Can you let everyone know one more time where they can find your books? Yeah, so the short story is available on Amazon for those of you who do not want to subscribe to the newsletter. But if you do subscribe to the newsletter, I promise I'm cool and will not spam your inbox. And then... The story is called Sacred as Laura's Calling, and that will be available on every platform that you can buy books and as well as you can get signed copies on my website. So, yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cause of Craft. For more information about Maggie's writing, head over to margaretcbeeler.com. There you can also join her newsletter for your free copy of A Sacred Tale, The Heart of the Kella. I'll have links to her website and her Instagram in the show notes and also at causeofcraft.com. Hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode and follow at Cause of Craft on Instagram to stay up to date on the latest news and clips. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Those reviews will help more people discover the show. And if you have feedback, suggestions, or guest recommendations, send an email to john at causeofcraft.com. That's J-O-N at causeofcraft.com. Thanks for listening. See you next week.